Welcome to Global Maritime News, the podcast, bringing you the most impactful news reports and analysis across the global shipping and supply chain industry over the past half week. I'm Levine, your host, and as of Wednesday, 19th January, 5 p.m. Singapore time, these are the major stories. Major South Korean shipping lines were hit with collusion charges as South Korean Antitrust Authority, Korea Fair Trade Commission, fined a total of 23 ship owners 81 million US dollars for price fixing. China is the world's top shipbuilding nation of 2021 as they beat rivals in South Korea. There seems to be no signs of slowing down in the global shipbuilding industry as we hear about Yangming and Eastern Pacific shipping announcements of new vessel purchases earlier this week. Following that, we explore why Chinese seafarer wages are skyrocketing as Chinese shipyards continue to push out vessels. Also in the podcast, following their failed merger, some positive news for Hyundai Heavy Industries as they secured cash to foster new growth engines. And later, we examine the sustainability sector, which had a busy week with the release of the new Getting to Zero Coalition Report and a new joint venture by NYK and Newton Group. So to start off, earlier in the week, container shipping lines in South Korea were hit with collusion charges. The South Korean Antitrust Authority, Korea Fair Trade Commission, fined 23 ship owners a total of 81 million US dollars for price fixing. This is the first time authorities have applied the Fair Trade Act to illegal shipping practices by South Korean companies. Since 2018, the Fair Trade Commission has been investigating allegations that the country's largest shipper, HMM, along with 22 other shipping lines, conspired to fix freight rates. According to the regulator, the shippers, consisting of 12 South Korean and 11 foreign companies, conspired to set the shipping costs of container cargo services 120 times between December 2003 and December 2018 in order to raise the minimum level of freight rates and other costs. Defending themselves, South Korean shippers have claimed that according to the country's Maritime Shipping Act, they are permitted to take collective action on freight rates and other contract conditions for transportation. The Korea Shipping Association also announced plans to appeal this decision and ask lawmakers to pass a bill to revise the Shipping Act so confusion will no longer be caused. Criticizing the fines, the KSA also said in a statement that this move will spark another crisis in the industry following the collapse of Hanjin shipping five years ago. They stated further that they expect negative impacts on the industry and how these fines in fact contradict the government's policy of rebuilding the national shipping industry. In response, the Fair Trade Commission maintained that the fined companies' acts were illegal as they failed to meet certain criteria under the law. Korean shipper Korea Marine Transport will be tentatively slapped with the largest fine of 29.6 billion won and HMM 3.6 billion won. Moving over to the other side of the Yellow Sea, China has claimed the position of the world's leading shipbuilding nation in 2021. China has topped three major metrics used in the global shipbuilding industry in 2021, claiming the top seat in completed orders, new orders, and orders on hand. On a global scale, Chinese shipbuilders accounted for roughly half of the total global volume, and for the first time, China State Shipbuilding Corporation, the country's largest shipbuilder, completed and delivered 206 ships in 2021, surpassing South Korea's Hyundai Heavy Industries to become the world's largest shipbuilder. Six Chinese yards also ranked among the world's top 10 shipbuilding companies list in 2021, further strengthening the nation's competitiveness in the global shipbuilding market. Continuing on, the shipbuilding industry is showing no signs of slowing down. Up first, Taiwan's Yangming Marine Transport is set to order five 15,000 TEU Neo Panamax container ship new buildings worth up to 1 billion US dollars. Earlier this week, the company's board of directors approved the contracts that are part of its fleet expansion and renewal plans, according to a regulatory filing. Moving on, Eastern Pacific Shipping, owned by Eden Offer, is spending nearly 700 million US dollars on new mid-size container ships, inking a deal with Hyundai Heavy Industries for up to six dual-fueled 7,000 TEU vessels. 
According to shipbuilding sources, the Singapore-based company has contacted the yard to build three firm vessels for delivery in 2024, with an option for three more ships. Related to China's booming shipbuilding industry, the high number of Chinese new builds are interestingly fueling the skyrocketing Chinese seafarer wages as demand for crew on board new buildings rise with each delivery of a new build. Given China's strict COVID-19 border controls, the demand for Chinese seafarers to crew new buildings leaving the country's yards has increased dramatically in the past two years. The world's largest shipbuilding nation maintains a zero-COVID strategy, which means owners and managers have little choice but to hire local Chinese crew for new buildings sailing away from Chinese shipyards. Sources indicate in the range of 1,800 to 2,500 US dollars per month for able-bodied ratings and 6,000 and above for junior officers. According to the China Maritime Safety Administration, the number of Chinese seafarers serving on international vessels reached a record high in the first year of the pandemic. The wage situation for Chinese ratings and officers appears to have stabilized with an improvement in the demand and supply as more Chinese crewed vessels are transferred to other nationalities of seafarers. However, it is expected that it will take some time for wages to fall. This is because repatriation of Chinese seafarers is both difficult and costly. As such, the obvious option of changing crews on board as soon as the new building leaves China is not feasible. With various quarantine regulations abroad and at home, it is hindering their return home and limiting the supply of seafarers available in China. As the saying goes, every cloud has a silver lining. This could not apply more to Korean shipbuilder Hyundai Heavy Industries that just secured cash to foster new growth engines. This comes after the European Commission blocked the merger of Hyundai Heavy Industries and Daewoo Shipbuilding and Marine Engineering over concern for dominance in the construction of LNG carriers. The European Commission's block led to Hyundai Heavy Industries seeing its three-year-long effort for the billion-dollar deal to fade. But this failed merger could be unexpectedly positive for Hyundai. An analyst at Samsung Securities, Han yong Su, explained that back in 2019, when Hyundai Heavy announced its plans to acquire DSME, it was at a time when shipbuilders really struggled to secure orders, and they competed head-on with other shipbuilders by lowering their prices. As such, a merger was really vital to generate economies of scale and become more price competitive. The analyst elaborated further that the shipbuilding industry is starkly different now. All Korean builders have enough orders on hand amid growing prices and that the shipbuilding market is entering the super cycle. Confirming this analysis, Hyundai Heavy, just two weeks into 2022, has secured shipbuilding orders worth 3 trillion won. With this, Hyundai Heavy now has the freedom to invest especially in new businesses such as hydrogen, autonomous driving, and robots. Over in the sustainability sector, there were quite a few developments this week. A new report put a dollar figure on the carbon price needed to decarbonize shipping. This new report, authored by the Getting to Zero Coalition, a group of leading maritime companies and environmental NGOs committed to reducing carbon emissions calls for carbon pricing of about 200 US dollars per ton of carbon dioxide. The report also highlighted the urgent need for policies that can make zero emission shipping commercially viable. The study also advocated for a mix of global and regional policy measures to make green fuels more competitive. According to Lloyd's Register and UMass, Zero emission fuels will be twice as expensive as conventional fuel options through the 2030s. This implies an urgent need for policies to close the competitiveness gap. The report found that by taxing undesirable behavior, such as emitting CO2 emissions, and using the proceeds to subsidize the preferred alternative, various carbon market-based policies, including fixed carbon taxes, cap-and-trade carbon credit systems, can be combined in ways that aid in decarbonization. In other news, NYK and Newton Group have established a joint carbon carrier venture for liquefied carbon dioxide transportation and storage. 
the major Japanese shipping group, NYK, and Newtson, the largest shuttle tanker operator in the world, will each hold a 50% stake in the new company, Newtson NYK Carbon Carriers, also known as KNCC. The company stated that liquefied carbon dioxide carriers will play an essential role in carbon capture, utilization, and storage, which could play a major role in realizing a carbon neutral society. This is especially as demand for liquefied CO2 carriers is expected to grow rapidly in the future. The newly formed company intends to develop a liquefied CO2 transport vessel using Newton's unique PCO2 technology, which will allow for the transport and storage of liquefied CO2 at ambient temperatures. Transporting CO2 at ambient temperatures eliminates the need for compression and heating, which are typically required for cryogenic and low temperature offshore discharges. Leading this new company will be Sven Stamler as chairman and Anders Lepso as CEO. And just before we go, some positive news. Clarkson's research found that green technology uptake is ramping up across the global shipping fleet worldwide. According to 2021 statistics, over a third of the order book by gross tonnage is capable of using alternative fuels for propulsion, an increase as compared to last year and even five years ago. The sustainability of existing fleet tonnage is also promising, as 4.3% of existing fleet tonnage can use alternative fuels, up from 3.6% a year ago. Clarkson's fueling transition report also shared that scrubbers, as well as energy-saving technologies, including propeller ducts, rudder bulbs, and air lubrication systems, have been fitted on over a fifth of the world's tonnage. Green port infrastructure is also expanding, with 143 LNG bunkering ports currently operational, another 93 planned, and over 1,229 vessels equipped with, or scheduled to be equipped with, shore power connections. And that is all for now. If you want to comment on this podcast and the topics that we have covered, you can send us an email. The address is maritimenewspodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Global Maritime News. I'm Levine Tan, and until next time, goodbye.